Best advice for all those young guys dreaming to working in animation or maybe being director one day? Well, I think that the, what I said yesterday is true. I mean, I, you need to uh, try to put yourself on the line when telling a story, and you have to. Uh, there's a there's a. If you pour yourself into your work with a passion, there is no bad job. Uh, and, and there's a lot, when you are young, the most desperate time is in our 20s. Because when you're in, the, in your 20s, you feel that you're too late, that, you, that you're wasting your life. Then when you're 30, you realize, no, I was obscenely young. And I, the world was completely open to me. But you don't realize it when you're 20. Uh, you realize that life is a fucking paradox. You realize what you have when you don't have it. So the only advice I can say is to tell them you have it, enjoy it. You, you sort of need to pay the price with your time to become a professional at what you do. But it, the world is regimented where it rarely happens before you're 30. Rarely. There are very few exceptions, most of them tragic, because then it ends when you're 40 or 45. So you have to understand the wisdom is, you know, very rarely you're going to find a club like a Mozart or a Steven Spielberg doing his first movie in his 20s and being active in his 70s. That's really, really rare. So you have to really talk to them and say, be patient, be yourself, and give everything you do 110%. How important is it for you that your films should be seen in cinemas? I mean, last night we watched Troll Hunters look spectacular, also it's a TV series, but sort of a very, very big screen. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're working with Netflix or countries like that on feature films, mm -hmm. would it be some I mean, point of principle for you that the films should have a theatrical release, or in certain circumstances would you be okay with them? Well, I, I think that we, since the 1950s, uh, we have lived in a world with a variety of audiovisual media. You know, I, I was uh, very young when we had the first color TV in the neighborhood, and we it became an event. So you know, you, the language, the, the storytelling language accommodates each format. So uh, Stroll Hunters, for example, is a TV series with a very cinematic look but it's a TV series. We follow certain rules in the language that are cinematic, and others, most of them, are made for, for television. And the speed of those narratives is accelerated with each generation. And sometimes in our times, it accelerates two or three times within one generation. So to give you an example, an action movie from the 1950s, an action movie from the 1950s, or 60s, that was huge, intense action to an audience now looks very slow. An action movie from the 80s to some viewers that are young looks in, looks like a German realist, like a Fassbender film, you know, like, it's, it's paced like Tarkovsky for them. So what, what you need to understand is the same way that the speed evolves, the malleability of the medium in which narratives are watched for each generation becomes uh, stronger. Uh, a lot of the young kids can barely spend 20 minutes in a theater without texting. Uh, I had a lady say to me, we enjoyed Crimson Peak very much. I, I saw it with my son and it was a great experience because he kept Googling and explaining things to me. And I go, well, it's a reality. Would I want people to watch Lawrence of Arabia on their iPhone? No. But to each, to each narrative you have to have a certain, you have to con conceive it for that. I prefer that people watch uh, Pacific Rim on a big screen 
and we're fast labyrinth on a big screen that's small. But the reality of the world is that's malleable. Uh, and for younger generations, the length of attention span and the medium in which narrative plays is more malleable than for us. You know, it's a sign of aging when you become uh, completely uh, religious about it. I prefer uh, uh, big screen. My generation going to the movies was a religious experience. So you went to church, but it's not the world anymore. And I don't want to be the old guy that says, it was better when I was a kid, because it wasn't. It was fucked up. You know, so every generation changes, but yeah. I don't know, did I even answer your question? <laughs> There's a question. Yes? Hi. Any news about the mount any news about the mountain of madness? No. I mean uh, I, I I I think my dying words on my bed as I die I'm gonna say mountains of madness. <laughs> I don't know. I mean I I I I, I hope it gets made one day. I think there is a possibility of doing it in another medium down the road, I don't know. I mean, it's a project that stays with me, so... I now control um, all the art that was done for the movie, so that's very good. But uh, nothing concrete. Yes, behind Hello. You said yesterday that um, you consider um, animation as a medium and not a genre. Yeah. So, um, what kind of freedom have you got in animation versus live action? Uh, creative freedom? Yes. Okay. Well, and technically as well. Well, technically, see, there are two different, completely different disciplines. In, in animation, you have full control, but you don't have accidents. And you need accidents for a narrative to feel complete. There is a Japanese notion called wabi-sabi, which basically talks about imperfection and accidental things being part of the creation of something artistic. Uh, I think in, what you need to simulate in animation is the accident. For example, when we're doing a special effect uh, in a movie, you need to add a camera mistake or you need to add water in the lens, or you need to add, you build in mistakes to give the sense that that shot is real. In animation, it's the same thing. For example, if you saw the clip yesterday, uh, we staged it very much like a live action. He goes to talk to the teacher and adjusts the bench, the little bench from the piano, and then does it again. You have to plan that. It's what I was talking about yesterday, about the foot going in the shoe in Miyazaki that if you're animating the mistake that his foot is not hitting the shoe, you get that for free with a live action actor. So animation is the complete control, but the, you work hard for an accident. Live action is the accident, and you work hard for control. That's completely different. But in terms of creative freedom, I think if you're working in the arena of family films, you you have to know that you're making that, but within that you're very free. Troll Hunters has operated in complete freedom. With the, and, and that's why the artists and the writers and the creative people, Rodrigo, uh, Ch everybody is incredibly happy with the series because they are very well protected, you know? But what I was saying yesterday, for example, a movie like Anomalisa, Charlie Kaufman's Anomalisa, is vital for animation to say he chose that medium as part of the reason he made the movie. It's an animated movie that is incredibly adult, incredibly moving, profound, brutal, but he chose animation. It's not an accident. And it's part of his expression. And the more in Europe and in, in, in the East, in Japan, you have perfectly adult movies. Uh, like Satoshi Kong, you know, that are completely realized adult films that can compete with any adult film anywhere in the world and they are not uh, bound by an audience. So one day it'll happen in the, in the, in the North American 
uh, plateau, you know. But that's why Anomalisa for me was a very important film in, in, in saying you can and should tackle adult goals. I mean, I'm doing, for example, Pinocchio, hopefully in stop motion, and uh, it's not, I'm not making a movie for kids. I'm making the book, which, yes, the book was for kids, but it was really dark and, 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 and had its own fairy tale logic. And you try to do it for, you, you're not constrained by it. You're doing the best you can artistically. When you're realizing a vision and trying to draw in your audience, what usually comes first in your mind? Is it the look and feel of your world, or is it the narrative? It's the same thing. I mean, to me, visual is narrative. It's not thank you very much. It's, it's, uh, uh, I think film is analyzed most of the time wrongly as uh, content, thank you, content and style being separate things. They're not. Uh, you, Colors, light, uh, design, texture, all of that are narrative elements. It's as if you saw a painting by Gauguin and you did not analyze the brush strokes and the vigor of the color and the palette. You don't. You don't approach the Gauguin and, and say, what is it about? Oh, it's some women laying around on the floor with fruit. You cannot describe painting like that. You have to say it's vibrant, it's powerful, it deconstructs the color, the brush strokes are confident and thick and a single line. We don't do that with film, but we fucking should. So for me, it's a single thing. When people say, oh, we love the way this looks, but it's the same. Sometimes what you do is you texture, you make a simple story with incredibly complex visual. Sometimes you do the opposite. You make a very complex story with simple visuals. But I, for me, the way I understand my craft as a storyteller and a director, form is content. And if, if, you, if you could or want, shoot the shit with me or a coffee, we would talk about my movies in purely formal visual terms or audiovisual terms. And they are as important narratively. That's what I said yesterday. The first lines that a character speaks are visual. When a character shows up, the way that character is standing, the way that character is dressed, the color and texture of his dress or her dress, that's the first line that it speaks to an audience. But most of us don't analyze it. Most of us just watch and say, that guy looks badass, or that guy looks uh, weak, or that, you know, we qualify it internally. So it's narrative. So, there's a huge component of criticism and analysis of film that should be about the brush strokes and the color and the vigor and the composition. Now, but for me, it all comes at the same time. Hi, at one point there was a project of doing a Pacific Rim animated series, if I'm right. Is it still going? And could you update us a little bit on the Pacific Rim universe since uh, John Boyega has joined the, has joined the project? Thanks. Yes. Well, <coughs> the, a lot of what we developed for the series ended up falling into the second movie. Okay. Like we, we had a whole arc for the series. We were doing designs. And then when we, when we tackled the second movie, we realized, oh, there's a lot of great stories in there. Let's fold them into the second movie. There's still a plan of trying it. We tried, we commissioned very expensive tests in 2D in Japan. And uh, uh, then we started saying, can we do it 3D? We're still thinking about it. But so many concepts ended up in the second movie that we need to restart. As to the rest of the details, I leave it to the director to keep them for you, but we're having a lot of fun with the second one because the, the setup was the first one. So now we get to have fun with the characters. Newt, Godwill, you know, uh, Michael. Uh, we can enjoy time with them and it's very different. And at the same time, you're going to get fantastic mecha, fantastic kaiju, kicking the shit out of each other, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it'll be 
when Pacific Rim 2 is happening, I'm going to be making uh, my little Searchlight movie, which I adore. And at the same time, it's a lot of fun to see this huge playground unfolding. Steven is a really, really beautiful uh, choice for director. Yes. Good morning. Uh, we're talking about Japanese animation. Um, what have you eventually learned, uh, especially from Japanese animation, in terms of directing style and storytelling? And uh, concerning your monster adaptation from Urasawa, how far or close would it be from the original manga? Well, uh, I think that the, the storytelling, the way you construct the three-act three structure in the West, does not quite apply to storytelling in Japan or in the East. In China, Japan, Korea, the narrative is very different. When you watch, for example, a Korean crime film, uh, it's completely different from the West. Uh, Everybody is stumbling, do, making mistakes. The cops are incredibly inefficient. It's a really fun difference. Japan, uh, when you watch a movie like uh, what did I see recently that I adored? Uh, Letter for Mama, you know, which is gorgeous. Uh, it's much more elegiac and pastoral and relaxed. You don't have to get to a, the beats of a three-act story, fuck that shit, you know? They, they go at their own pace, they go at their own, in their own way. And it's beautiful, and you learn from those differences that culture is a much more vital thing if those differences are kept alive. Uh, also, what I love about Japanese uh, animation is uh, there's a lot of pantomime in the big, yeah, there's a big gesture as well, but at the same time, sometimes they go into such subtle, beautiful moments of character animation that is, I think is unique in the world. You know, uh, as far as the Rosawa, we are, uh, uh, we have written the first three episodes and you have to translate, you have to move it to the West uh, because you're not going to set the series in Tokyo. No, you, we, so necessarily you are going to do uh, that. Should the series be in Tokyo, then you do it a Japanese series. But we are we are changing it to New York, this and that. But, uh, but I think that uh, everything has been done by running it through Rosawa, which is rare, you know? He reads the screenplay, he reads the adaptation, and he says good or bad, you know? Uh, because I, I think uh, in, in his case, he's not, he's a god. You know, he's in the pantheon of creators for me. So it would be important for me that he likes it, you know? But uh, we, we are still, uh, we have written three episodes, and we're happy with it, but we need to keep going. You know, the, the, the mythology is so profound in Urasawa. The way he layers uh, the past and the present, the depth of the mythology and the programming of the kids is so complex that it, I think when we have 10 of those episodes written, we'll see if we are getting a hold of it. So imagine that is d developing 10 or 13 hours of storytelling, and I want to do it slowly the right way. Hopefully, it'll happen. There was a question. Yes. Your mention of wabi sabi and uh, impressionist painting uh, reminds me of the Japanese concept of shokumen, which is a, a Zen craftsman who works every day at his craft to attain a, a higher level of craft. Um, what what kind of uh, experimentation do you do in your drawings when you're planning a project? And is there ever a key illustration or a storyboard or drawing that kind of guides you through the whole creative process? Well, you know, I used to uh, do a lot more, more uh, drawing in my notebooks. I do a lot of more writing now. Why? Because uh, I used to draw everything myself because I didn't have people that could do it for me. Now I'm working with guys like Guy Davis, Oscar Ciccioni, uh, Francisco Ruiz Velasco, the guys I collaborate with often. And I know 
I'm going to do it on a page and we're going to make it much better than what I could do. And technically, self-taught and not, you know, I'm, I can sculpt, I can draw, I can paint. I wouldn't have a show of my stuff. You know, it's just communication tools. So uh, what, what I do every day is um, I have a huge part of my day that happens just here. And I'm constantly thinking about story and images and color and what to push. You know, and each movie is very different uh, as an experiment. Uh, I can tell you that visually, Pacific Rim, for example, is as intricate visually as Pan's Labyrinth or Crimson Peak, but it's a very different, it's a pop exercise. It's the difference between doing a vinyl sculpture and making a sculpture in marble, you know? But as a sculptor, you want to work in both mediums. So, um, I think the exercise for me is uh, one time Alfonso and I, Alfonso Coron and I were talking about him going to do Harry Potter and I had done Blade and, and uh, part of the conversation was Alfonso said to me I want to make sure that I make it my movie what, what do you think I should do? and I said look making a movie if you do it wholeheartedly you're going to leave some DNA in there <laughs> you know your imprint is going to be there because you are promiscuous with the material you know you kiss it and you hug it and you run around in bed with the material, there's going to be hair samples, there's going to be all sorts of DNA of you. If you don't, if you were distant with it, nothing will happen, but you're going to be down and dirty with it. So, you know, I think that uh, the exercise for me is, can I do that with a huge movie and then do it with a small movie? And try to go from a big movie to a small movie and apply myself emotionally and spiritually completely into it. It doesn't matter how it looks from the outside, from the inside, my promiscuity is equally intense with the material. So it's the opposite of Zen, I guess. It's, it's a Mexican Zen. <laughs> Do you ever consider to doing a movie in Spanish again? Yes. In fact, it's uh, I don't want to talk about it much because every time I say something, it gets fucked up. <laughs> but yes, yes, the answer. Is. Can you use a question? Yes. Hi. Um, what would the Atsi Festival represent for you? What's the importance for you to uh, be here? Is for present your work or to recruit? You know, uh, it's a life experience for me. It's not a, there's not a goal. You know, I don't work, I don't function like that as a person. I don't go, what am I going to get out of it? Yeah. It's, I didn't know what to expect. And I can tell you, I'm, I'm deeply in love with Annecy. I just fucking love it. It's because uh, most of the people that truly like what I do are creators. Like the, the audience that connects the deepest with what I do you find our people that draw, that write, that design, you know? And uh, to find an entire festival of people like that, it's a gift. In my world, it's a gift. It's paradise, you know? So I am madly in love with it right now. It's, it's first love, first of all. So I'm in the stages where my fucking endorphins are firing all day long. I'm like, wow. I'm in the wild stage with Anzi, you know, like, oh, she's so beautiful. Oh, the way she drinks water. Oh, the way she eats that chicken. Everything is beautiful. So that's, uh, so what is it? I spend most of my time alone creatively. And when I meet with people that I feel, feel, that truly connect with my stuff, it's very emotional for me. Because you know, most of the time I'm in a fucking dark cage, mumbling some shit, and hoping that it's true when I come out of the cage. And people go, yeah, yeah, you said it. You know, it's, it's a very difficult process, and this is, this is the candy. This is the joy. And, and, and yes, part of it is recruiting, for sure. In the sense that when I did uh, 
Pan's Labyrinth. Half of the concept people that designed stuff with me before production even started were kids that were 20, 22, that had done comic books, that had never made a movie, that I met at festivals or comic book stores. And I said, this guy is great. And right away, you know, there was a kid, a Mexican kid, Pablo Angeles, whom I met in Mexico City, and he went to do uh, really quickly, I had him in The Hobbit. And his second job was uh, uh, Hellboy, Hellboy 2 and then The Hobbit. From, from being uh, a fan in a comic book store that I met. So, yeah, it, but I, I, I would say recruiting is to an entire award. It's meeting, meeting people that you enjoy being with and allowing that relationship to continue in a different arena. Uh, can you tell us about uh, your job as a uh, producer for the book of life? Uh, did it uh, make you want to do more animated films? Well, I, I had... Part of what I tried to do is try to produce first-time directors. Why? Because I was a first director once. And somebody incredibly good came to my life, which is Berta Navarro. Guillermo Navarro's sister, who was my producer, and is still my, my partner in producing. And she trusted me. So I tried to do that for other people. I have produced so far, I think, nine first-time directors or something like that. Um, and Jorge came to me, and he was Mexican, funny, and fat. And I said, that's a great guy. You know? So I, I'm going to produce him. I truly love him. I, you know, and for me, it's visceral. I'm a very visceral guy with what I do in my life. And, and I, I felt if, if we don't do, if I don't produce this movie for this guy, nobody will. Like, it will die. And it was such a beautiful world. Um, now, my role as producer started with the story. The story when I came on board was very different. Very, very different. So we sat down in my house and we started, I said, look, if you like these ideas, I'll produce a movie. Blah, 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 the serenade, uh, he's a singer that doesn't want a bullfight, blah, blah, and we, we communed. And I still have in my house, in a prominent place, uh, he brought a box of tequila. And I never opened, I don't drink. I drink beer now and then, you know? But, uh, and port. And, 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 and uh, I still have his box in a prominent, because I love that guy. And I love that movie. And, and we made sure that he had all the freedom he needed to make the movie what we wanted. And, and I adore it. I, I think it's one of the things I've done as producer that I'm the proudest of. Now, I stay involved in every stage. And I'm always a very good and terrible older brother. Like I tell it like it is, but at the same time I try to protect it every stage of the way. I suggested, for example, that Paul Williams and Gustavo Santolaya wrote the songs for the movie. Because I love Paul Williams and I'm friends with Gustavo and I thought it would be a unique combination. I suggested that Gabby Beristein, who had been my photographer in Blade 2, did the cinematography of the, of the animation and so on and so forth. So we, but I never get confused. As producer, I know I'm not the director. And you have to, if you, if you need to produce, you have to remember that. Because if you ever get confused, if my role is to be in a boxing match in the corner, where the guy getting the punches is Jorge. The guy getting the shit beaten out of him is Jorge. But I'm in his corner and I go, you're doing well, even if he's doing terrible. You're doing well, you're gonna knock him out. Even if internally they go, he's gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> but you're in the corner, but you're not the boss. Some producers, if they're producer directors, get confused and it can be horrible. I don't. Okay, so we'll take two last questions. Okay. Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, yesterday, uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg mentioned about your collection. How important is that in your creative universe? Well, you know, uh, 
I'm not a collector, funny enough, I'm not a fetishist, you know? So to me, uh, the place I have, which is two houses joined together, they are a church. And those objects are relics to me. Like, I don't know how much they cost. I don't know if it's Spider-Man 3 in a bag, in perfect condition, is 700. I don't give a fuck. I open the toys, I play with the toys, I read the comics, I take them to the toilet, I read them in the toilet, I read them at, at lunch, I read them at... They are things that I live with. And they represent images that are important to me or have been important in the past. So when I look, now I'm, I'm a self-taught artist, so a lot of the originals I collect, I, I have them so I can look at the line work and see, for example, Richard Corbin, whom I love, he uses a lot of whiteout in his drawing. He's very messy. Bernie Wrightson, who's another artist I love, has, in his Frankenstein pages, he has zero corrections. He's like a machine. And I analyze the art. Uh, I, I love to have a, a Mobius watercolor and see how incredibly clean Mobius was. I have line work by Mobius with zero corrections. So, you know, they are things that fit me as an artist. Uh, when I walk by the life-size statue of Ray Harryhausen in the garden, or I have, uh, I live, I'm like the Michael Jackson of horror, because I live with life-size silicon figures that look at me and I go, I'm coming down the stairs and I look at H.P. Lovecraft and I smile. I go, hey, how are you? It's, it's insane. But it's an insanity that is religious for me. So, but if you ask me, I have never, ever, ever known speculated like a collector. Never say, I'm lacking number 10, I want a better number 10. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care about those things, but it's a religious thing. And so the last question. Uh, considering your experience, would you say that there is still a French touch in animation? In French what? A French touch in animation. In, uh, do you understand why France is still very attractive in the animation world? I think it's, it's, it's France and it's Europe. I think that Spain also has a huge animation component that is important. And I'm pretty sure it's Italy to some degree, but France and Spain, uh, look, there are two realities to, to, to the world of animation. One is artistic and the other one is industrial. So from an, from an industrial point of view, the lesser interesting point of view, uh, we're always going to be driven by workforce, exchange rate, things that are really, really base and horrible. So people are going to come because talent is good from a commercial point of view. From an artistic point of view, you're talking about two, uh, two cultures, especially France. France is unique in the world, very much like Japan in a way, where animation and comic books are sacred, beautiful forms of art, adult forms of art. So when I was a kid, and Spain in many ways has similar makeup, not on animation so much, but on comic books. When I was a kid, uh, I would read uh, Metal Roland, or I would read uh, Pilot, or I would read uh, Fluid Glacial, or I would read, uh, in Spain, I would read, read The Underground. Uh, El Vibora, Star, and I thought, my God, this, this, these are places where stories are being told that are powerful. To this day, I don't read much superhero stuff. I read underground comics. I follow religiously authors that are sacred, like Jim Woodring or Chester Brown, or I read new people like Emily Carroll or Kate Beaton, you know? Uh, and, and there is that potential. And there is that will, and I think that I wish and hope that the animation industry in France recognizes the talent that could do uh, life-changing movies in an, in an older, more adult spectrum, like it happens in Japan. 
But even in Japan, right now, there is a huge crisis in 2D animation, in continuity, in the possibility of doing movies that are adult in content and very well made. I think this is a very crucial moment of inflection in the animation world everywhere, and France is incredibly important at that. Not only as creating content, but as analyzing and promoting content. I mean, when you go, <coughs> when you talk to a France, uh, a French geek, is one of the richest, it's like coffee, man. There's shit coffee in America. There's fantastic coffee in France. It's the same in the fucking geeking out. You geek out with a French geek, and this French geek is gonna know cutting edge uh, literature, cutting edge animation, comics. It's not just mainstream. So it's, it's, it's incredibly important when you discuss uh, animation with uh, uh, a, a geek in France, the artistic value, the literary value, the cultural value of that discussion is incredibly strong and it defends it as an animated, uh, as a cultural artifact. It's not just the pop value, it's also the cultural value. So I think France is key in preserving the analysis also of the art form and the elevation of the art form. You can discuss Japanese animation in America or in, in, in Europe with deep passion. Uh, and I think, yes, there is a touch. Uh, but uh, curious enough, I tell you, the sense of timing and the sense of light and the speed of gags is very different in Europe. Even, even when they try to, when they're making a movie for America and they try to copy the tempo, it's more European. And, and I think that instead of controlling it or changing it, there should be local French animation that doesn't try to hide its Frenchness, but embraces it. You know, and makes it a salient. We were talking about Korean thrillers. A Korean thriller trying to be an American thriller is very boring. But a Korean thriller that fully embraces the idiosyncrasies is great. So I do hope and pray because uh, each each cultural flavor is important in our world. That each country, America, France, Korea, whatever, preserves its cultural idiosyncrasies. Because the danger we're facing in the fact that we live on a global island is to homogenize content, you know, into being a single fucking flavor. You don't want that in food, you don't want that in culture. You don't want it in coffee either, you know? So hopefully that voice will still exist and all of that. May I say one last word? Because I know we're gonna get the fuck out of here. One more. That happens in comics too, in bande dessinée. You know, in, in many comics uh, right now in America, you they become almost like pitches for movies or pitches for a TV series. It's like a stepping stone form on the way of doing something else. And the same is starting very slowly to happen in European comics. And I think that's a tragedy because European comics were always a bastion of uniqueness. So hopefully we understand or creators understand that comics are great as comics. They're fucking great. And we should preserve them rather than thinking, oh, I'm making a comic to make a movie. Or a TV series. It's, it's, hopefully that won't happen. And that's it. Let's get the fuck out of here. Thank you. Thank you.